Thank for the scriptures of today. It's taken from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night, and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Father, we just want to thank you for this word. We ask, Lord, that you will give us each a fresh revelation of what you need to speak to us about your kingdom. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And we know that Jesus spoke in parables. So what is a parable? It's a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as was told by Jesus. Miriam Webster's dictionary gives the de definition as a usually short fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. What does the Bible say about parables? Jesus teaches his disciples and his followers by using parables among other methods of teaching. A parable is a teaching method to illustrate the familiar to the unfamiliar concepts or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning using comparisons. So now we see the purpose of the parables found in Mark chapter 4 verses 10 to 12. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now for everyone who wants to listen, God has something to say to each one of us. But it depends. You know, sometimes you may be physically sitting here with your mind somewhere else. Maybe already planning what's to be doing, what you're going to be doing after you finish the service. When you are here to hear the word of God, it doesn't mean just hearing the word of God, it means doing as well. So what are the blockages that come in the middle? One is sin. If you have sin in your heart, nothing can penetrate it till you clear it up with your God. Second, maybe you are worried about riches. Yeah, we all here in Kuwait to make money, but that's not the only thing. If you haven't found Jesus as yet, it's a big, huge loss because it doesn't say concentrate on money only. If you concentrate on Jesus, you have much more 
than riches cares of this world maybe a house car whatever anything maybe your position in the office pride ego lack of interest in spiritual things usually when we say spiritual we don't want to do it right now maybe we think tomorrow maybe th we think when we grow a little older but i tell you if you are a person who puts spiritual things first who puts god first you will see great changes in your life and uh, any other things that may be so jesus is telling them not is speaking in parables not to confuse them he says seeing they may see they all saw jesus some of them physically they saw him there they saw his miracles but it didn't make any impact on them because their hearts were hard they were expecting a messiah and the messiah is standing right in front of them he is doing so many miracles but yet it, they cannot fathom that a carpenter this guy is the messiah and hearing they may hear they were hearing his words they were doing whatever he you know they could go around you may be following jesus you may be coming for the services you may be attending all the prayer meeting you may be doing everything but if your heart if your heart is not after him like david i tell you it will not make any impact you know he wants us all to change he sent god sent jesus to win us all back to him there's no exceptions so all of us all we need to do is to focus on following him with all our heart you may know the scriptures by heart you may be good at saying it may be good at uh, you know preaching teaching whatever but if you do not know or have a relationship with him it's no use at all so first try to have a relationship with him why should he give you more when you are not using what you already have each of us has been given a talent each of us has been given something where we can promote his kingdom but when you are not doing anything about it i don't think he wants to give it to somebody who will just keep it aside he wants to give it to someone who will use it maybe that person is found outside the church god will go and get them in just as when the jews did not they were stubborn they went on doing whatever it is the gentiles was brought in so god wants us all to be people who are running after his heart so today's gospel is the final two stories pointing to the kingdom of god so what is the kingdom of god as christians it is essential to understand the meaning of kingdom of god if someone asked you what the kingdom of god meant what would your answer be we find that in romans 14:17 for the kingdom of god is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the holy spirit the word kingdom of god is used about 70 times in the new testament and 30 times in matthew's gospel the kingdom of god is talked about in different ways in some places it says kingdom of christ kingdom of god kingdom of david kingdom of heaven and sometimes only the kingdom so even though the words differ the scriptures embody the same thing the same meaning the three things that the kingdom of god should mean to us is the rule of jesus christ on earth and in heaven the blessings and advantages that flow from living under christ's rule the subjects of this kingdom or the church so when we say kingdom of god or kingdom of heaven 
We are not talking about something that is going to come to us in the future. It's already here. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God was here. He came in the form of man. So if we say we are believers, born again believers, the kingdom of God is right within us. You don't have to go searching for it. How important is it for us to understand this concept? John the Baptist used it often as he said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He also used it in his teaching when he taught his disciples how to pray. He said, your kingdom come. In the Beatitudes, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in the Last Supper, Jesus said, I will not drink again of the fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to say that the kingdom of God is at hand? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand is said in Matthew 3, 2. The kingdom of heaven drew near to mankind when Jesus manifested himself here on earth. He implied that the kingdom of heaven is now available to each one of us in the person of Christ. The Jewish leaders were looking for a physical kingdom, not a spiritual one, though they knew that the Messiah was coming. But sometimes we may know many things, but yet not be ready for what God wants to reveal to us. So the kingdom of heaven is a reality now for each one of us in the present day. Why does Matthew use kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God? Throughout the gospel, he keeps saying kingdom of heaven when he's talking about Jesus' rule and the good news of his reign. He says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The doctrine is the same, no differing views over there or meaning. He's just saying kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God because the Jews were sensitive to use the word God. They were giving respect to that word and they used to avoid using the word God. Now, Matthew talks about the breakthrough of the kingdom and the arrival of Jesus in his incarnation. He announces the coming of the kingdom at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And at the end of the book, he speaks about the final consummation of the coming of that kingdom in the Olivet Discourse. So from the first chapter till the last, he's talking about the kingdom of God in the appearance of the king himself, who is the Messiah of Israel and the fulfillment of the kingdom given to Judah. Now, Matthew is talking about Jesus right from beginning to end. See how Chris Swanson puts it. He says, there is no genuine distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The two expressions are basically two unique approaches to show the same thing, a system of government or a kingdom that is ruled and controlled by God. The authority to rule was given to Jesus by his father and he is now seated at the right hand of the father. At an assigned future time, at the hour of Christ's subsequent returning, Christ will then carry this rule from heaven to earth. As such, Christ will reign with authority and power of God and of heaven. So we see from this we understand that the kingdom of God is the reign of God in our lives and in the world. So today's gospel is talking about two short parables. These parables are talking our stories about seeds, but it is actually the parable about the kingdom of God. They each start with the words, 
the kingdom of god is like so to understand it we should start thinking what is the kingdom of god in the parables uh, of mark 4 he concerns himself with issues of the kingdom of god specifically he deals with the spiritual aspect of the kingdom this is the realm that we are living in today because we say we are believers and we have the kingdom resident in us there is another aspect a physical and a future which jesus will fulfill when he comes back again now he is using these stories to illustrate biblical truths for those who are willing to hear the three parables found in mark 4 the first one is found in verses 1 to 8 where the sower goes sowing the seed and it falls on different types of soil let me tell you first that if a farmer is going to sow the seed definitely he takes good seed with him no farmer will take seeds that will give crops which are not good so if you're going to sow it you're going to take the best seed and make sure you sow it then when it falls on good grounds it produces fruit 30% 60 and 100 now 30 means you still not right something must have gone wrong then there is a 60% and then there is a 100% i'm sure if we are at the 30 level we can see how we can increase it to the 60 and those who are on the 60 to the 100 we don't know where we are in our walk each of us has to make sure that we are having a closer walk so that when the fruit is seen it is much better than what it was in the past the point is unless the seed is scattered there is no produce unless it germinates it is useless so we've got to make sure that the conditions are right The next parable is talking about the growing seed and we focus on the process of growth. The seed's growth is not dependent on the sower. Yes, he sowed it, but it doesn't depend that so and so put it and that's why it's going to come up. Next is important that there is a sower. There may be seed and if there is no sower, it cannot be sown. Then no seed planted there will be no growth the seed scatters he scatters it and then waits for a result no one puts the seed today and expects fruit tomorrow so he has nothing more to do he made sure that the soil is right he scattered it now he has to wait for it to ripen and bear fruit although he understands the process any farmer understands the process that has to be done if he wants to get fruit but it is still a mystery how it grows he cannot watch it develop he cannot put the seed go next day pull it up and see how much it is grown and put it back again it has to appear above the ground for him to see what's happening the plant will grow but in its own time there is a process he cannot control the process the earth will give its yield but the process doesn't depend on him plants do not suddenly spring up fully grown so it grows in stages we know that if it's taken out too early it'll be immature if it is taken out too late it'll be spoiled so we got to wait for the right time when the conditions are right we put the sickle and take the food fruit now we go to the mustard seed after explaining the spiritual aspect of the kingdom in terms of the seeds limited in its productivity the type of soil and further explaining how the growth takes place which is outside the capability of the sower jesus turns towards the manifestation of the seed a mustard seed we know is very tiny and it produces a plant 8 to 10 feet tall the birds find shelter 
they hide among its branches and there is seed for nourishment for them. Now using this illustration, God is talking about the growth of his kingdom. He is demonstrating the amazing power of the gospel on the people. The parable invites us to think about this small mustard seed sown in the earth and what a great bush comes from it. In fact, it is told that it's as tall as one story building. So you see, it was just a tiny seed. In Palestine, during the days of Jesus, the mustard seed was a common metaphor when they used to talk about small things. Not only in size was the mustard seed small, but in its significance as well. It was like the poor beggar, insignificant, and they used to be referred to like the mustard seed. Now the mustard seed are the followers of Jesus who we think will not produce anything. People who don't understand. You see, the religious people of those days understood everything. But the poor folk who were following him, like these fishermen, his 12 disciples, they just followed him and became, you know, something that was not expected from a fisherman or a tax collector. Yet we see that they were people with doubts. They were people thinking, we are just ordinary folks. How do we go behind this person who is doing all of these miracles, etc.? But they had faith and they were following him. So, Jesus' ministry from that day till today, we see it was just one person, Jesus, who came. From there it was the twelve and then it has been going on. Nobody would have thought that one person could do so much. Similarly, one mustard seed can grow into such a big thing, no one will think about it. Your God is able to take small things and make it big and make it happen. You don't know how he does it, but he does it. And when you feel you are alone, nothing is happening, believe that you are with other believers and God is working out something, however small your faith may be, your God can make miracles out of it. And we are told that one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. He doesn't say minus so and so, he says every. That means one day, that seed which he sowed by coming onto this earth will find fruit here on this earth. He has faithful followers all over the world. And so no matter how small your faith may be, when it is joined up with others, you'll see great things happen. We know that our God is doing something. You do not know what. Just like the farmer put the seed, doesn't know what will happen till it comes up. So remember your God is definitely doing something behind the scene because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. So what does all this have to do with how we apply these parables to our lives right now? These parables accurately illustrate the work of God in the life of the believer and the church as a whole. The parable of the sower has to do with salvation. That is the beginning. Unless the word of God penetrates your heart and takes root, there is no spiritual life in you. If a person doesn't have a heart that is receptive to hear his word, you cannot receive the seed of the word of God and there will be no fruit in your life. The second parable builds on this by showing us that God's word and grace in your life will bear fruit. It will bear fruit, that means you will grow spiritually. The seed has been planted. The job of the sower is complete. The rest is up to God. There is no magic formula to, for spiritual growth. There have been many books written, but without books, so you may read many books, many books available in the library, etc. But the heart, the soil of your heart 
is more important than books. And then there are some things that you can increase your spiritual life or growth by making it easier. Cultivate a habit of reading the word of God daily, pray, get into Bible study. You know, when you cultivate, doesn't mean the weeds won't grow with that. Weeds will grow. This evil one will come and put weeds there. But you need to know that if you have the word of God, you have to know how to take out the weeds and the good fruit. Make sure that you are in right company, talking to the right people, and you will find that as you come closer and closer, the soil of your heart improves so that the seed of the word of God can germinate over there. The growth, however, in the end is none other than that of God. The hand of God should be in that. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You know, you may take a long time to get to know the word of God. My brother-in-law gave me a Bible eight years before I touched it. Now, when did I touch it? When my husband passed away and I came to Kuwait because I had no money. And then when you have no money and you have nothing else, and you only have your Bible, is that's when you start opening and coming closer to God. So you do not know when God will tug at your heart. Maybe you kept your Bible nicely somewhere. Thank God I brought it with me to Kuwait so I could read it. You know, God wants to use you. You may take n number of years to come closer to him, but he has his eyes on you and he will get you somehow or the other. You may be reluctant like Paul, but he knows how to get you. So if you're stubborn today, thinking not today, maybe tomorrow, I say start today. Because when your heart is soft and you listen to him, you'll find that he's able to work on you. Philippians 2.13, it is God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now the other thing we learn from the parable of the growing seed is there is a process we don't become spiritual giants overnight, okay? you got to continually feed yourself. Just as for your stomach, you give food. Not one time or once in a week, you give it every time. Same way, spiritually, give yourself the food that you need to grow. You don't become mature believers overnight and neither does the plant grow overnight. The key is the seed and its work. Remember, the word of God is seed. So you read the word of God, meditate on it. The soil is right, it will germinate. If you want to grow spiritually, let it be that the word of God richly dwells in you. Richly, okay? Not just a little. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Thoughts and your intents. God knows it all, okay? You can't hide from God, so don't even try. Next, Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces? You may say there is rocky soil. He knows how to get you. Jesus wants us to know whether we can see it or not, he is at work and he will, he will work and in the end, all of us will be drawn back to him. I'm reading to you something about a 17-year-old schoolboy in Ghana. He watches his teacher cover the blackboard with a big sheet of white paper and taking a black marker, placed a black dot on one corner of the paper. Boys, he said, what do you see? All of them shouted in unison, a black dot. Then he said, so not one of you saw the large white sheet of paper. The way to live is not to dwell on the black dot, but see what God is doing on the whole. God is working and doing great things, but we focus on something very small. Look at the big picture. Always ask the Lord, 
what are you doing in my life show me and he will so we see we look when we look around if you hear the news you read the newspaper everything you hear is bad but i tell you among that bad things good things happen and god is working slowly but steadily and therefore don't concentrate on these black dots concentrate on the big white sheet that he is working on christians as christians we need to step back and see the great things god is doing in our lives and the lives of our other christian brothers and sisters our text says today as soon as the grain is ready the farmer comes and harvests it for the harvest time is come i don't get what god is doing i don't know what god is doing but in the end i know god is able i'm certain that god who began a good work within you will bring it to completion on the day when jesus returns the parable about the kingdom of god reveals the spiritual growth is continual it's a gradual process and is fully consummated in a harvest of spiritual maturity we can understand the process of growth by comparing it to how the plant grows now do you have faith in god's work one summer a drought threatened to destroy the crops of the local farmers on a hot dry sunday the local pastor told the congregation there is nothing we can do but pray for rain go home pray believe and come back next sunday ready to thank god for sending rain the next sunday the pastor was furious from the pulpit he declared we can't worship today because you do not believe a member of the congregation stood to respond pastor we prayed and we do believe without a moment's hesitation the pastor responded then where are your umbrellas you came expecting rain but you came without your umbrellas that means you weren't expecting it right then second question you got to ask yourself are you growing the wrong seed are you planting or you are putting seed which is wrong some time ago readers digest told the story about a company who mailed out some special advertising business postcards with a mustard seed glued to it with the following caption that went something like this if you have faith as small as this mustard seed in our product you are guaranteed to get excellent results and we totally satisfied it was signed by the management a few months later one recipient of this promotional piece wrote back to the company and said you will be very interested to know that i planted the mustard seed you sent on your advertising card and it has grown into a very healthy bush producing wonderful tomatoes so the seed was different okay so sometimes we grow things we don't expect because we are planting the wrong seed now jesus thought thy kingdom come this then he said how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name the next slide please your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one we know that this is the lord's prayer we are taught to pray not only for god's will to take control of our lives but also that the saving gospel message will go out to those who do not know it we have become part of god's kingdom we accept the sacrifice of jesus and we know that because of what jesus did on the cross we are able to have the privileges of being with him eternal life is given to us how about those who are lost we need to reach out to them as well praying for god's kingdom should be our focus as believers for a fruitful life and for jesus to be made known all over the earth 
Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what we got to make sure, that they're going to be born again. Then Jesus used of parables. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them and they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. This is the conclusion of our scriptures of today. Jesus adapted methods according to his audience and desired to understand. He didn't speak in parables to confuse them. He wanted to sincerely challenge these seekers to discover the meaning of his words. So if you want to discover the meaning of his words, when you come here, bring a notebook with you, write down what is said, go back home and look through again so that it's fresh in your mind. Otherwise, what happens? Hardly you out of the door, you've forgotten what was said. You want to grow in the word, you've got to make an effort to learn. Just as a student has to study to pass the exam, you have no exam, but you want to grow spiritually. So which means it takes a little effort from you, your side. Now, Jesus was always talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Jews, because of their impure motives. And he was trying to get their attention that they needed to change. Jesus did not speak to them directly in the beginning because that would have hampered his ministry. Now let us look through with all these things that we learned about the kingdom of God. What is this seed all about? Jesus causes the growth, but we must be faithful to sow. You are called as a believer to sow. God depends on us to do the planting, that is evangelism. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If a church does not have evangelism, then it's like a fire. If there is a fire, it will spread and destroy other things. But if there is no evangelism, same way, we are trying to spread, not to destroy, but to get people into the kingdom. A church that does not have evangelism is as good as dead. We should be going out and bringing people into the church. Then God does the growing. Salvation comes from no other but God. You may plant, you may water, you may do everything. Growth comes from God. Just like the seed, it's planted, the farmer has done everything. The growth is none other than God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 to 9. For when one says, I am Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is the police and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. So then neither the one who plants, nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So each of us has to do our part and God will give the growth. Last, God uses us to help the new life grow. That is discipleship. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, The things that which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Are you faithful? He needs faithful people to move out. The seed is his, he owns it, he can do anything with it. The act of sowing, you know, think about a farmer, he has got good seed, he can either, you know, if they are in poverty, use it to eat, 
or he can scatter it to get more fruit next year when he does it, when he gets it similarly for us it's an effort to go out and get people into his kingdom but it's worth it because they will be coming in and they will be rejoicing in heaven don't expect to rejoice later unless you are willing to sow today ask yourself how much would it cost for you to sow in tears when if it is a burden you are saying lord i trust you i'm going to do it come what may whatever i have you may have time you may have resources you may have you may be a prayer person you can lift up those if you don't have the uh, time to go pray for them or invest with your resources you will be rewarded because you know best how the kingdom of god can move forward you want to reap joy in your heart you want to have that rejoicing in heaven we need to do sowing in tears today christ lives in our heart as believers yet the kingdom of heaven is not yet completely acknowledged because all the evil on this planet has to be judged and eliminated jesus came first to seek and save the lost he will be returning again as judge and he will be ruling the earth are you ready for it are you ready to usher in his kingdom to those who do not know him yet we know that god is a good god he wants to see that each one of us is brought back he doesn't want to see anyone lost so if you have anyone in your family anyone among your friends or at your workplace who still do not know jesus let's rise up let's pray for them because god doesn't want anyone to be lost let that be our burden as well kindly stand father we just come into your presence we just know lord that you want us to plant good seed and lord you want us to do the work of a sower because if there is seed and it is not sown there will be no crop help us lord to have that burden for those who are lost the same burden that you had on your heart when you came down to earth though you went through such a painful death yet you were there for us we just ask that that burden will be upon us as well to know that your desire is to win those who do not know you still and you are expecting us to go ahead and do that work help us lord give us that word daily that it will be one soul at a time that we will want to win for you lord show us how we do not know how sometimes maybe the words don't come out but we have your holy spirit with us show us lord what we need to do so that your world your kingdom on earth all of them will bow down to you the king of king and the lord of lords may your name be glorified always In Jesus mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen.